Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second workshop in uh, the Cyber Norms Conference 2020, a workshop with the title um, uh, International Cyber Order in the Making. We have a lineup of a number of really interesting papers uh, for you to discuss, but let me begin by introducing myself. My name is Bibi van den Berg, and I'm a professor of cybersecurity governance and the head of the cybersecurity governance research group at Leiden University. And it's my pleasure to be the chair of this session for this afternoon. So as I said, we have a, an interesting lineup of papers, four papers in total. And uh, I've asked all of the speakers to keep their presentations really brief uh, so that we have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. So we've asked all of the presenters to present their work in a little 10 minutes, so that's very little time. I hope we can all manage to do that. Um, the questions and answering will be done at the end of the session, so we cluster all questions together, but you can start submitting your questions during the presentations, uh, so please do. And uh, uh, on a note of um, me being slightly short-sighted, please uh, make sure that you uh, phrase your questions uh, slightly uh, in, in, in a short it brief so that it's easy for us to read and repeat. OK, now without further ado, uh, let's go to the first uh, uh, set of speakers. So this is a paper entitled uh, the National Cyber Power Index 2020 Methodology and Analytical Considerations. Uh, and it's actually written by a group of people. Uh, I'll name and list all of them. Uh, Julia Vu, Irfan Hamani, Winona de Somber, Daniel Cassidy and Anina Schwarzenbach. And they're all affiliated with Harvard Kennedy School, uh, School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. Now, the two speakers who will present this paper today will be Daniel Cassidy and Anina Schwarzenbach. Uh, Daniel is uh, an affiliate to the Belfer Center and uh, works in strategy and crisis management in the UK government. Uh, and Anina Schwarzenbach is a, uh, used to be a postdoc fellow from 2018 until 2020 at the uh, Belfer Center and is currently a non-resident fellow. So without further ado, I would like to uh, hand the floor to them and let them present uh, the National Cyber Power Index. Great, thank uh, you so much. Thank you, I'm just uh, uh, seeing whether I can uh, share the screen first. Can you all see the first, uh, the, the, the title slide? No. Um. No. Okay. Would you, um, I'll share my screen, perhaps. Let's see. Let's see if. That okay, works. please do. Thank you. Um, cool. Sorry, guys, about this. So, hi, I'm Daniel Cassidy. I'm, I'm one of the team, and I'm going to briefly talk through the background to our paper and our methodology in, in, in general. And I'll pass over to Anina, who's going to talk through the results because we came up with, with methodology and obviously we came up with a list of how we rank cyber powers around the world. This project started when Julia and Irfan thought they could write a quick paper just to define what cyber power was. They'd read lots of articles. They've had lots of speakers that talked about the US career sometimes Iran being superpowers, but they didn't find a, a good coherent definition of what cyber power was. So they thought, oh, that's easy. Well, perhaps it's like nuclear weapons states and, and nuclear weapons power that you can just count something, rank them, job done. Uh, that <laughs> rather ambitious paper turned into a year project and the results of which are the paper that hopefully you guys have seen. So. Traditionally, um, as I've said, cyber power was probably based on a very narrow focus on capability. So how capable was a nation of achieving a potentially offensive cyber attack? And, and that was basically the kind of combination that took place. We decided to take that out a little bit and inspired by the threat triangle, which we can see here on the right hand corner, we thought capability is only just one element. When it comes to understanding the threat that a terrorist poses, for example, you need to understand their capability, but also their intent, as well as the opportunity to do damage. So based on that, 
we decided to come up with a solar-powered definition that had two elements. It took an intent to pursue, um, an intent element and a capability element. We defined intent as that on the screen, so uh, uh, the pursuit of a national objective using cyber means, and we attempted to define um, capability by a slightly broader definition of the tools available to, to a nation state. Uh, we decided to keep this at the government level rather than necessarily wide affiliate organisations or industry. So, um, but perhaps that's something we can tease out in the Q&A if that's sort of, is of any interest to anybody. Okay, so intent. We, using IR theory, uh, we broadened the number of objectives that a state is trying to achieve using cyber power from offensive defensive to eight, and these are on the screen. Um, hopefully they're self-explanatory, but I'll quickly go through them. Um, monitoring domestic groups in your own country, um, international norms and regulations, manipulating the information environment, gathering intelligence in overseas countries, and, um, and also growing your own uh, technical industry. Um, and then uh, finally, the more traditional ones about destroying an adversary's capabilities and infrastructure and defining technical standards. Uh, we had one other one that is not did not make the paper because we couldn't find any evidence for it, but we thought that actually amassing wealth and extracting cryptocurrency was another objective that many states followed. This resulted in a, um, in a formula that's on the screen, but I'm understanding that you guys can't see the screen. Is that correct? I think, uh, Daniel, we can walk through the presentation like this and we will uh, give, uh, you know, the report, a link to the report where they can sure. see all the details. OK, well, well thanks, Nina. Well, in which case, over to you to sort of just go through the, um, the findings of our report. Yeah, correct. Uh, so basically, uh, our day, I think that one of the most interesting parts of our project is actually that we combine this capability and intent. Uh, and so we came up uh, with a uh, cyber power index formula. Uh, and so we, uh, for, for each of the objectives of interest that we have, and these are seven in total, we, uh, we look at the capabilities and we come up with a score. We look at their intent and come up with a score and then combine those together and average it. And this is then our cyber power. Um, OK, and so the question is obviously how does a, a country demonstrate intent and how does it demonstrate capability? We came up for a very uh, specific methodology on that, which is very well documented in our report. And I, I will share the link so if you have like interesting questions in that you can look it up but it, it's based on a lot of uh, different indicators for foresight for the two sites with a lot of um, uh, carefulness also in keeping the two, uh, two the two distinct uh, uh, and then in coming up with a measure where we can compare basically the, in the, the, the indicators together uh, for the intent part it's based mainly on the cyber strategies uh, and uh, on and for the capability part, it's based on, on a series of different indicators that we then have normalized. And then uh, I just write, I jump right into the results, which is maybe like the most interesting part. <laughs> uh, and you can see basically with this table, uh, you can see, uh, oh, finally we have this, the, that's yeah, perfect. You can see uh, how you have the overall score uh, and then the score for capability and intent. And I think this shows really well our methodology. And you can see uh, that you have obviously, so we, you have a, a total ranking uh, of the countries, but you also have a ranking per capability and per intent, which differs uh, sometimes quite importantly. Like for Australia, they are ranked number 16 for capability and number eight for, for intent. Next one, please. And I show also uh, this slide, which is, I think, very interesting and useful. So uh, our measure was really with the idea to, first of all, uh, you know, uh, expand this uh, and, and build upon this idea of cyber power and looking at cyber intent and capability theoretically. And on the other hand, 
also uh, really bringing a, a tool that can be used by practitioners in the field eventually. And so this is uh, a, a map they found very useful where you uh, see your capability ranking and intent ranking up uh, one against the other and you see where the countries are kind of situated in this landscape and you see kind of how how close they are or far or far from other from other countries which uh, yeah uh, so this is kind of another depiction of, of the ranking basically another visualization uh, next one please so i'm i'm going through quickly because i know that we should leave them time for questions and obviously for all of that we could like dig in and very much very very detailed but we want, really wanted to give you kind of an over a very uh, a uh, very broad overview of what we have done. Um, I'm, I'm just like spending uh, one minute on, on this slide about the limitation because obviously so we wanted to provide a measure uh, that is kind of uh, has a bit a different approach from other measures that are out, uh, out, that are out there and are also very useful that have are look are maybe based more on, on expert uh, interviews uh, or ex expert advices and insights. Uh, and we really base this uh, only uh, purposely uh, only on openly available data. Uh, that means that it also comes with certain limitations that, um, yeah, the, in, in, in also a challenge to really uh, capture in, in depth uh, so some of, of these measures um, and also to find sometimes proxies in cyber uh, space. It means also like uh, every, I think every attempt uh, to uh, to really con to bring a concept of cyber power and a measure of it, also obviously deals with certain simplifications. So we have like uh, we took some specific decisions that had an, an impact also uh, on on the way we 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 gathered and we uh, aggregated the data. But all of these limitations are really um, kind of pointed it out and explained it and. And so kind of it's a measure that is, is a bit different from, from what is out there uh, with the idea that we want to broaden it up uh, and really base it as much as we can on publicly available data so that we can also reproduce it later on in a, in a new iteration. Uh, and also I kind of want to end with this challenge we faced, uh, which is I think an interesting challenge of the duality of, of, uh, of cyber power itself. So we have measures kind of uh, uh, are positive for a country and others are negative. So power is a, is a concept that ha has this duality in it. So we kind of try to, to account for that uh, as well a bit, but it's, uh, yeah. So this is kind of, it's a, limit, it's a, it's a limitation, but also I think a, an interesting challenge. Uh, final slide, please. Uh, this is, um, yeah, and so I just end with, with with the outlook, and then I think give it over for discussion or for the next presentation. Uh, so uh, the outlook for us after um, doing this research, we got uh, a lot of interest and attention, and um, so we, we we plan to to follow up uh, with the 2020 index uh, building on on the. We, we will keep the framework as we have it, but we will try to. And I include uh, um, to expand on our data we have uh, and to work in, in having an even better quality data. So there's a lot of work we can do in that side. So, uh, but that, that, that's kind of uh, our next uh, challenge for that. But the framework and this idea of combining intent and capability is really the core of the index and we will continue with that. There will be a new country included because we have only 30 now. Uh, and so yeah, and for yeah for the rest is it's kind of um, we we also always end the presentation with whoever uh, kind of has looked maybe at the report or is interested. We're we're always always have a, always an open ear also to suggestions for new data uh, and interesting uh, you know uh, documents we could include. So we kind of always encourage to reach out in case. Uh, yeah, somebody <laughs> has this data at hand that has like good ideas uh, because this is it's kind of a, a, a work in progress uh, and so yeah so we are looking forward to your to your comments and looking forward to the next presentations. 
Thank you. That's uh, quite impressive. Uh, I, I don't know if many people have seen the report, but it's a 84 page document. Uh, and you managed to uh, summarize that in just a little over 10 minutes. So I'm deeply impressed and very grateful that you did. Uh, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Let's um, continue with the second speaker. Um, that's Eugene Tan. Um, he's an associate uh, uh, researcher at the Center of Excellence for National Security at Nanjiang Technological University, uh, Singapore. And he's going to present a paper entitled Development of Cyber Norms in International Law in Asian. Are you ready, Eugene? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks, BB. Uh, can you see my presentation slides? Yes, we can. Yes. Uh, okay. So, uh, hi, uh, good afternoon, all. I'm Eugene, and uh, like BB mentioned, I'm Associate Research Fellow with the Center of Excellence for National Security at RSIS NTU Singapore. Uh, before I start, I'd like to thank our host, the Hague Programme for Cyber Norms, for convening this forum to discuss the development trajectory of cyber norms and international law and find ways, them, ways of putting them in place. Like most here, I believe that all states and stakeholders should contribute to the norms debate. The Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, is no different. I have to caveat here that some conflate ASEAN with the ASEAN Regional Forum, but these are two separate entities. ASEAN is the regional organization and the other a mechanism for dialogue with extra regional partners like the European Union, China, Russia and the United States. My remarks today on the development of cyber norms and international law in ASEAN will touch upon three main points. First, the state of play in ASEAN thus far. Second, how ASEAN has agreed to abide by the 11 UNGGE norms, despite its structural dif difficulties. And third, why ASEAN member states have chosen to advance further discussions at both the Open-Ended Working Group and the United Nations Group of Governmental Experts. So point one, what has ASEAN done so far? to advance cyber norms. I would classify ASEAN efforts into two main thrusts, diplomacy and cyber capacity building. The first effort is the diplomatic effort to get ASEAN member states to agree on a way forward on cybersecurity. ASEAN, the regional organization, prides itself as the first regional organization that agreed in principle to be guided by the 2015 UNGGE norms as part of a rules-based international order. The political declaration by ASEAN leaders to accept the 11 norms proposed by the UNGGE was made in both the ASEAN leader statement on cybersecurity at the 32nd ASEAN summit in April 2018 and the 2018 ASEAN Ministerial Conference on Cybersecurity, or the AMCC. Apart from the declaration, the 32nd ASEAN summit further elicited statements from leaders recognizing that norms and the rule of law is needed for cyberspace and as a basis for advancing economic growth in the region. The 2018 AMCC also called for a more formalized mechanism for ASEAN cyber coordination. Regretfully to date, regional integration of cyber policies and the development of cooperation mechanisms has largely remained at a political or ministerial level. At this year's AMCC, held just last month, ASEAN member states reiterated their collective commitment to take practical steps to enhance the cybersecurity of the region, in particular, the urgent need to protect national and cross-border critical information infrastructure that serves as the backbone for regional communications trade, transportation and logistics links. At the same time, ministers and heads of delegations have also agreed to develop a long-term regional cybersecurity action plan to implement the norms of responsible state behavior in cyberspace, taking into account the national priorities and cyber, cyber capacities of individual ASEAN member states. In other words, 
ASEAN is moving from the political commitment to broad principles towards the finding of practical ways forward in adopting the 2015 UNGG norms. In part, this move towards practical adoption of the 2015 UNGG norms is reflected in Singapore's support of the recently submitted Food for Thought paper to the OEWG and the UNGGE to create a program of action for advancing responsible state behavior in cyberspace. The second effort is capacity building in the region. ASEAN leverages its relationships with states from within and outside the region to address its deficit in capacity. Different ASEAN member states have stood up initiatives to provide capacity building programs in collaboration with others, such as the ASEAN Japan Cybersecurity Capacity Building Center and the ASEAN Singapore Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. These capacity building measures can help ASEAN member states understand cyber threats better and may lead them to reach a common understanding on what cyber norms and international law mean to ASEAN, especially once these threats become more apparent to the domestic security of ASEAN member states. So this brings me to my second point. Why did ASEAN accept the 2015 UNGGE norms and not other norm initiatives? And why is it significant given ASEAN's character? I argue that the similarities between the 11 norms recommended by the 2015 UNGGE and obligations enshrined in the ASEAN Charter is the main key reason for the relatively swift adoption by ASEAN member states. For instance, the norm calling on states to not knowingly allow their territory to be used for internationally wrongful acts using ICTs can be mapped onto Article 2, Subsection 2K of the ASEAN Charter, calling on ASEAN member states to abstain from participation in any policy or activity including the use of its territory pursued by any ASEAN member state or non-ASEAN state or non-state actor which threatens the sovereignty, territorial integrity or political and economic stability of ASEAN member states. Lest you're wondering, given some ASEAN member states less than stellar adherence to international human rights regimes, the guarantees on human rights provided for in the 2015 UNGGE norms are also protected in the ASEAN Charter, ASEAN Charter and the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration. Understanding the character of ASEAN and how it relates to cyber norms formation in the region is also important to appreciate why the move to be guided by the 2015 UNGGE norms is significant. ASEAN is not the EU where there is tight integration of rules and law among EU member states. The legal systems and traditions of ASEAN member states are different and unintegrated. Despite this, ASEAN member states work on the basis of consensus, meaning every pronouncement with ASEAN in it speaks with the full force of the community. The agreement to be guided by and putting into practice the 2015 UNGGE norms has the same standing in and among ASEAN member states. Also, ASEAN member states attach great importance to international law and a rules-based international order, especially those norms and rules that they have had a hand in making. This is true in both cyberspace and the physical space. The use of international law adjudication is one of the key methods of conflict resolution in the region, and there have been a few prominent cases that I'm sure you have heard of like the Permanent Court of Arbitration ruling on the South China Sea. That said, there are prominent treaties that ASEAN have not ratified as a community, and each state still retains their own prerogative to subscribe to what they believe to be in their national interest. Take the ratification of the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime as an example. While the Philippines has signed up to the Budapest Convention, ASEAN as a regional grouping has not agreed to be guided by the convention. This piecemeal adoption by ASEAN member states can also be seen in other norm initiatives like the Paris Call. This does not, however, mean that ASEAN will not eventually adopt or sign up to these initiatives, 
but the process of garnering consensus from all ASEAN member states may take significantly more time. This brings me to my final point, which is why ASEAN has chosen to advance discussions on cybersecurity on both the UNGGE and the OEWG tracks. Regionally, there is recognition that there is an urgent need to address cybersecurity issues irrespective of political views held by the OEWG process led by Russia and China or the West-sponsored UNGGE process. Indonesia and Singapore, the two current regional representatives to the UNGGE, together with the Philippines, voted to advance both processes in spite of the ideological differences between the processes. Singapore and Indonesia are of the view that both processes are not incompatible with one and with each other, and that both processes have been amended in the negotiation process to reflect the different views. While ASEAN recognizes that existing international law applies in cyberspace, and the mapping of existing international law to cyberspace may allow states to further their discussions on the applicability of international law in cyberspace, which is what the sponsors of the UNGGE approach seek. It will, however, not be a stretch for ASEAN member states to side with states that want a treaty approach to the governance of cyberspace, which is what the sponsors of the OEWG want, because such a process will create a rules-based order that ASEAN member states can follow. In closing, ASEAN has always followed its instinct of creating an internationally agreed rules-based order based on its own interests. This is consistent with its experience in other arenas where international law is or was unsettled. I believe that the approach to governance in cyberspace will not yield a different outcome. With that, I thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions. That's wonderful. Thank you, Eugene. That was a very clear and concise presentation. OK, let's uh, move on to the third paper. And uh, I'd like to ask the speakers to get ready. So their names are Arindrajit Basu and Kartik Natyapan. Uh, Arindrajit is a research manager at the Center for Internet and Society in India. And Kartik is a research fellow at the Institute of South Asian Studies of the National University in Singapore. And together they have written a paper called Will India Negotiate? The Politics of Multilateral Engagement for Fostering Responsible State Behavior in Cyberspace. And I would like these two gentlemen to, uh, to, to ask if they're ready to start their presentation. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, thank you, Bibi. I think we're ready. Good. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, so thank you and thanks to uh, you, Korean, and the entire team at the Hague Program for CyberNorms for putting this conference together. Uh, really a great set of papers and presentations already. Um, just a quick introduction on the paper itself. So India has recognized, been recognized as a digital decider, a key swing state in the debate on cyber norms. But um, if you actually look at uh, voting patterns, statements, even documents that have been coming out of uh, New Delhi, uh, what we found is that the behavior is, is strikingly quiet and in certain places even confusing. Uh, so, um, and this is different from India's behavior in the geoeconomic space. So if you look at India's engagement at WTO or G20 on, on data localization and other issues, they've been very, very, very active. And so while you can identify trends, or I was able to identify trends, before I read Karthik's excellent book, uh, Does India Negotiate, which was the inspiration for this paper's uh, title as well, uh, there was no real overarching framework to understand India's behavior and India's strategic uh, behavior in this regard. And what we've tried to do here is essentially apply the lessons from uh, Karthik's book that he's a, uh, I mean, impressive book that's applied it to four uh, regimes that came out in the 1990s and tried to extend that to India's behavior with respect to cyber norms. So I'm going to hand it over to Karthik to really explain uh, that, that that book and the main findings and how we used it in this paper. And then I'll come in and explain uh, the cybersecurity and cyber norms dimensions of our paper. So over to you, uh, Karthik. Great, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, so so what I will do, you know, in the next few three, four minutes is describe India's approach toward international regimes before gauging how India behaves when it comes to cyberspace issues. So scholars, you know, have generally noted that 
India has been a multilateral obstructionist, a state that is keen to disrupt, veto, and delay negotiations for international rules and block agreements. Uh, the, the broad notion is that India has and has had a defensive attitude when it comes to multilateralism. And if you look at issues like climate change, trade, nuclear matters, uh, India has apparently stymied international agreements and negotiations. My own research um, shows that this narrative is overstated and it does not reflect how India has actually behaved multilaterally, um, especially since the 1980s on many uh, transnational issues. So more fundamentally, in, in the last three decades, India's interests in the international order have grown just as its economy has, which has generated greater convergence. So in other words, India has a clear and identifiable interest in shaping and rejecting uh, international rules and norms which affects its development and security. And there is a domestic politics that is driving um, India's behavior with respect to international regimes and while negotiating international rules and norms. So two conditions matter here when we are trying to ascertain whether India will shape and ratify international rules. The first is institutional capacity. Do Indian officials negotiating such rules and norms understand the policy problem? Um, it could be global warming, it could be protectionism, or an issue like cybersecurity, which is driving international discussions and negotiations. So do officials have a workable grasp on these different issues that they are that they are negotiating? Often this knowledge base, if it's robust enough, um, particularly on specific technical issues, um, then that influences Indian positions at negotiations and the general attitude toward that rule and agreement. So institutional capacity also works to diffuse or neutralize the politics around which rule, how rules are perceived in India, which could potentially lead to greater compromise and not conflict. So what we can then expect is an India that will be more proactive, that will engage on issues uh, because it affects its core interest, given its own understanding of the policy problem. So that's the first condition. The second is interest group pressure. Now, interest groups can often shape how Indian officials and institutions negotiate international rules. Not all interest groups have equal access or influence on these transnational issues, but some of them do. And these groups also shape and fill knowledge gaps within the government, which could then tip the scale when it comes to how India negotiates a particular rule or international norm and how it discusses it further. The fundamental point I'm trying to make is that India's interests on multilateral transnational issues are not set in stone or preordained, but are actually constructed through a politics, through institutions and, in and interest groups that shape the politics of global governance in India. So what does that mean when we're trying to understand and explain how India negotiates on issues like cyber, digital and technology matters, right? So broadly, it means that we need to understand and unpack the domestic political economy around cyberspace and the digital in India. Who are the institutional actors? How do they perceive cyber issues, rules and norms? And what is the level of involvement from non-state actors? Could be corporations, firms, civil society actors and other groups that are also determining what India's interests are on issues like cyber norms and how India should behave at the UN and other regimes. So I'll give it back to Arundhajit now to apply this yeah. on, on, on cyber rules. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Kartik. So I'll try and answer the three questions that that Kartik has posed. But before that, just for maybe people who aren't so familiar with what India has done, because it's difficult to sometimes find in, uh, Indian behavior on, on on cyber norms with this regard, and it's it, it 
took took us a fair bit of digging. So first of all, just a broad uh, explanation of what's going on so far. So India, unlike several other countries, Netherlands being one of them, there has been no statement whatsoever on how international law applies to cyberspace. No, no, uh, no clear statement. Not even a indication, right? There's been one minor thing by the deputy NSA at the time, Arvind Gupta, on uh, opposing the talent manual, but that was a small two-sentence part of a speech that was delivered, but nothing further in that regard. Voting patterns. um again confusing unpredictable so for example in 2018 when there was the oewg gg split um india voted for both resolutions india also voted in the third committee for a resolution that uh, russian resolution on cyber crime that has been criticized by civil society across the world um so un voting patterns again not much there not much of help there isn't there's a national cyber security strategy from 2013 but that doesn't refer to international law or cyber norms and there is one in the works but again uh, there is no clarity on whether it will refer to to cyber norms in terms of coalitions india has signed on to the global partnership on artificial intelligence um again nothing no nothing clear on what india's uh, intense will be in that regard but they have also not signed the paris call for trust and security in cyberspace and the reasoning behind that is uh, i have got so, so some confidential information has uh, uh, informed me that that was possibly because there was um uh, opposition to the budapest convention which is referred to in uh, in the in the text and i think uh, brad smith also mentioned this is the reason in a in a panel he was on uh, so it's it's uh, very uh, confusing and ambiguous and therefore this framework that kartik laid out is actually very helpful to understand not only what india's actions have been but to understand where india is going so very quickly on the three questions first on interests it is clear that there is a short term interest that india has in preserving cyber security depending on the quarter of the year india is the most cyber attack country of the year uh, in the world or they are definitely in the uh, in the top 5 so there is a definite short term interest in that regard uh, but i think it is because of um, a uh, lack of appreciation possibly of the long term benefits of in engaging consistently on cyber norms and use, using this digital decider tag to shape rules in a way that benefits india's uh, global standing and uh, constitutional ethos there hasn't been that much uh, resources in terms of the foreign policy uh, think tank being uh, committed to Uh, to the cyber norms debate specifically on institutions a number of institutions exist that govern cyber in the military in the foreign policy in the ministry of external affairs um in the ministry of electronics and information technology number of institutions exist but there is no coherent vision that ties these institutions together so if you read kartik's book and look at the history of how uh, institutions have actually worked in the past they have worked the best when they are collaborating with each other from different wings within government and that's not happened yet although there are and i'll speak about this in more detail in a bit but there are two exciting institutions that have come up recently the defense cyber agency that's uh, sort of bringing together the best of the three wings of the military and they have actually spoken about articulating a cyber doctrine and also the uh, ministry of external affairs has set up a specific division for emerging emerging technologies we don't know exactly where that will go but uh, again sources have revealed that they are interested in this debate quickly to end um three factors that i think might uh, change the way india behaves and will in impact whether india will negotiate one is china i think uh, over the past year the chinese threat it's just a hard security threat in terms of china of course the, there's the, the conflict at the border and then there is the conflict with regard to india banning chinese apps on democratic grounds right suggesting that uh, they violate privacy and they violate the security of indian citizens to actually show that uh, they are able to shape rules in a manner that's different from china we think that it's possible that that might lead to a greater impetus to negotiate more firmly and play the role of this digital decider so to speak the second is as i mentioned the change in institutions and the final is that um if you look at the number of academic papers and think tank policy papers being published on the geopolitics of cyber security within india and also external interest on india so i know that there is another paper being presented later on in the conference that looks at india and indonesia i think and that's an example of greater academic interest uh, so that's that's possibly uh, something that might increase engagement within uh, civil society and also there is greater interest in the media and particularly in india i think uh, the political risk discourse is often driven by how much interest the media is showing in it and particularly after uh, the china um, 
the 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 china uh, uh, ban a ban of chinese apps there's definitely been interest shown by the media so those are trends that we haven't really analyzed entirely it was a very short part of the paper but we hope to analyze in more detail going forward uh, i'm uh, just handing over back to kartik very quickly to maybe say what we plan to do uh, in 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 the next couple of months on this paper that's it from me thank you very much yeah so so going ahead i, I think the paper will have to deal with and um and, and and unpack these domestic political and institutional factors more clearly uh, as the paper identifies the institutional politics around cyber issues in india is getting more complicated not less uh, and since we do not have official records as of now that reveal how india behaves at the un uh, within specific working groups on these issues we need to really uh, rely on other methods it could be interviews uh, it could be triangulating from different forms of of data that's available out there to get a a good empirical sense of how india is actually negotiating on cyber matters so the empirical grounds are still rather weak we need to i think speak with a few more officials that are discussing these issues but also from other actors that are shaping these matters domestically and as arundhati mentioned the the politics uh, around cyber issues and the digital um especially around data and digital trade matters have become uh very vibrant and exciting in india uh, there are a lot more actors out there uh including both domestic and foreign that are trying to shape uh not just what india's policies and rules are on these matters but also how india engages externally with um with global cyber regimes and other fora uh we also have new cyber institutions that are being established a possible new cyber security strategy that is hopefully released soon so there's going to be a lot more to glean from in terms of a more fluid uh cyber politics in india that will help us uh explain how india will behave in this space going forward i'll stop there that's wonderful thank you thank you for a great presentation um i've already seen that there's a couple of questions for you later but we'll uh, let's first turn to the last presentation uh, it's a presentation uh, by taylor grossman who we all remember from last year with a wonderful uh, presentation as well this year uh, she has a paper called disinformation campaigns and norms of emergency communication in cyberspace and taylor is currently a cyber research analyst at the carnegie endowment for international peace um taylor are you ready yes uh, can you all hear me yes we can great uh so i will just share my presentation um, it's wonderful to be back. Thank you so much uh, for having me. As an early stage scholar, this um, is a really wonderful uh, <laughs> venue. So I'm I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, let's see. This should be shared. Let's see. Right, is that working? Um, great, so as I said, my name is Taylor um, and my previous work has focused on deceptive practices and uh, cyber attacks, but today I'm looking at deception in disinformation campaigns. So I just wanna start by um, looking briefly at the typology of information disorder. Um, I just wanna set the stage. I know there are many different definitions um, and I'm using definitions um, provided in the 2017 Council of Europe report, um, and these have also been used widely in the field. Um, so in this typology, we have a Venn diagram of false and harmful information. So misinformation in this context is false information um, that is shared, but where no harm is intended. Malinformation is when authentic or genuine information is shared in order to cause harm. And then disinformation is when false information is knowingly shared to cause harm. And my focus is on disinformation and specifically on imposter content. So imposter content is false information that is posing as originating from an official source. 
And I am interested particularly in content that masquerades as from an official government source. Uh, so this is where um, there's imposter content and context. So this is information that's originating not just from a trusted outside authority, like a journalist or a news organization, but actually from a faked government or insider authority. Um, and I'm trying to separate this from faked news sources or spoofed headlines, fake news websites, um, which I think is obviously a growing issue, but is, I, I believe, qualitatively different from this particular form of imposter content. So here's where the principles of emergency management and communication come into play. I'm looking particularly at imposter content that comes from an, a faked official source and that claims to be providing information about an ongoing emergency. And so I want to outline uh, the emergency management process in its ideal form first. Um, so, you know, in an ideal world, a society has built up institutional commitments and mechanisms, and these include reporting systems for emergencies such as 911 uh, or 999 you know, and requests for information in non-emergency settings. And these mechanisms allow authorities to respond to individual incidents as opposed to society-wide emergencies. Um, and these systems uh, ideally are um, building up public trust. Then these institutional mechanisms can help frame and promote education and preparedness. Um, and this is helping to create a well-informed public that's prepared for emergencies. And often this education and preparedness is tailored very specifically to a local context. So I grew up in California in the United States, uh, only a dozen miles from the San Andreas fault line. So we had many earthquake drills um, and were taught to stock up pantries on, you know, sort of non-perishables uh, and the necessities. So uh, again, a very context specific type of emergency preparedness. Um, then in the event of an actual emergency, you have systems of alert and warning. Um, and if the public has been well educated, then it knows where to look for those alerts and warnings. And it also knows how to interpret these warnings. Um, and so this system is, is hopefully helping to build a resilient public that can respond appropriately and in its own communities. Um, and then the public response is aligned with institutional responses. Um, and again, in an ideal world, this is creating a feedback loop where public responses and institutional responses build off of each other. So you have first responders and government authorities that are acting in alignment with community-based public responses. Um, and then a well-functioning system is then feeding back into institutional mechanisms, um, building additional trust, and then also building um, awareness about education and preparedness. So when you have imposter content that, again, is functioning in this context of pretending to be a government source, it's weakening the relationship between these alerts and warnings and public responsiveness. And because there is this breakdown in trust in the public, alerts and warnings are now primarily funneling directly to the institutional response. And so the institutional response is now the primary, it's now primarily responsible for framing your public response. And you're losing a lot of this sort of organic community-based public response that would have occurred if the public had more trust in these alerts and warnings. And this really weakens this feedback loop um, that is occurring between institutions and public responses and might even break it down. And it certainly puts more pressure and strain on institutions to respond. And this also uh, poses you know, a new threat to um, the relationship that the public has with institutions designed to protect it and has spillover effects to uh, these other institutional mechanisms and education and preparedness um, because there is, again, this weakened public trust. So I want to just look briefly at a case study of imposter content. Um, and this occurred um, in 2014, early in the morning of September 11th, residents of St. Mary Parish in Louisiana began receiving alarming text messages that warned them of a malfunctioning chemical plant nearby. And these texts read, toxic fume hazard warning in this area until 1.30 p.m. Take shelter, check local media and columbiachemical.com. So this created uh, a panic on Twitter. Um, images of a CNN homepage began circulating on online forum and um, even a YouTube video um, surfaced, which showed ISIS claiming credit uh, for this chemical plant problem as, as some sort of attack. 
Um, however, this entire incident was fabricated. Um, this parish, St. Mary Parish, does house a variety of chemical and natural gas plants, including a plant called Colombian Chemicals, slightly different uh, from the text messages, which said Columbia Chemical. Um, so there is no plant called Columbia Chemical, um, but more importantly, there was no actual explosion. Um, and this attack is particularly interesting because of its use of both imposter content and imposter context. Text message systems are often used for emergency alert systems. And implicit in this event is this use of the texting procedure to emulate official channels and communication. And there have been other recent examples of this uh, trend of growing. Um, in Virginia in 2014, there was a winter storm in January um, and a fake government Twitter account uh, arose that began to circulate false information about road closures, school closures, um, and other issues. Um, there's also um, the COVID-19 ongoing pandemic, uh, which unfortunately has made this conference go remote, um, has, has or, you know, created a lot of new opportunities for imposter content. Um, I have one example up on the screen of uh, the United Kingdom where uh, text began circulating um, that warned individuals that they had broken lockdown procedures and would face fines or other kind of penalties. Um, these seem to be primarily financially motivated at this point, um, at least in the UK, um, but there obviously is an additional element of um, sowing panic and creating chaos and also breaking down um, the reliability of text messages as as a way of um, transmitting useful information about um, local conditions with COVID-19. So how should we think about imposter content? Um, it's particularly tricky because good emergency management and communication often relies on multiple platforms and mechanisms. And community-based emergency response and preparedness um, generally emphasizes the importance of reaching out to different populations in a variety of ways. And this can include Twitter, text messages, web portals, email alerts, press conferences, radio messages, etc. And the variety of communication mechanisms has an, a benefit in the sense of imposter content because if imposter content surfaces, it may be easier to overwhelm it in these other platforms. However, the breadth of communication channels also means that there are multiple attack vectors for malicious actors who seek to sow confusion and panic. Um, and there are many ways to parody government communication now. Um, and in part, diversified emergency communication is important because the vulnerabilities in, in our local communities are not necessarily evenly dispersed. So some communities in particular might rely on a specific mechanism of communication. And if that becomes compromised, they might not be easy, they, it might not be easy for them to tap into you know, multiple other venues to find corrected information. So if their initial touch point becomes compromised, you may start to lose the public responsiveness in that particular community. And so this raises two questions for my research. The first is normative. I, I'm interested in, is this a specific case in disinformation campaigns worthy of special consideration? Is imposter content that mimics government, um, government sources, particularly in um, moments of emergency, you know, does that merit special consideration? And the second is an operational question. Um, how can we build robust emergency management and communication mechanisms in this age of disinformation and particularly on so many different platforms. Um, this isn't a new problem. Uh, rather, it sits in a longer historical arc of warning systems from civil defense in the 1960s to terrorism warning systems in the early aughts um, and now to imposter content in the internet age. Um, so spoofing government authorities has long been a practice of malicious actors. So this may be an old problem, but we do need to think about new solutions. So I want to stop there. Um, this is very much a work in progress. Um, so I am open to thoughts, comments, and suggestions. Uh, and again, thanks so much for having me. And with that, I'll turn it uh, back to you, Dr. Vandenberg. Thank you. Wonderful presentation as well. It was our pleasure having you here again. OK, um, going to the questions. Uh, there's quite a number of them. Uh, I'm just going to start at the top. Um, and that's a question for Daniel and Anina. There's a number of them, uh, so maybe we should do these first. Um, let me begin by asking you, uh, it's a question from Florian actually, what specific IR theory did you drive your eight objectives from? 
So, yeah, great question, get it right to the heart of the difficult stuff. Um, I think I'll caveat my answer by saying a couple of things first. Once we try to be neutral in our assessment of objectives, so they were, we're many practitioners in the team and we sought to take a very practical view of it. So, um, for example, one of the ones we mentioned was surveilling and monitoring domestic groups. We didn't say whether this was a good thing or a bad thing. So many of these were, we tried to make it as agnostic as possible. So when I say we took these from IR theory, I think, I think it's better to say that we were inspired by IR theory. So we took the general constructs that are there, that to be honest are fairly neutral, regardless whether you believe the world is, you know, you take a realist view, a liberal view, a constructivist view. We, uh, we took the, the, the fact that objectives are used to divide into domestic and foreign, we've done that, and we've looked at, you know, economic defense, norms building. So um, it's, it's a good question. And I think I'll actually try and, uh, one of the things I think I want to do is actually build the theoretical background to our papers. I think that'll really strengthen it, but I'll, 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 perhaps I'll defer the answer and say I was inspired by rather than taken from. Yeah, and also like the general, you know, intent uh, or the general formula of power, uh, this was uh, theoretically inspired by work on, on the definition of, of power and on looking at threat vectors and looking at capabilities and so that the way we have combined that is it has a, a theoretical backbone as well uh, not only the objectives but also the way we have defined power itself okay fair enough i think uh, the next question is sort of a follow-up to what you were just uh, saying uh, daniel so uh, andre barinha says uh, very interesting work on um, sorry no uh, first another question from simon van hoeven um, we read that the Belfair Index seeks to measure and rank cyber power. However, does this index also work well to measure the threat each cyber power can pose? If not, are there any measures you believe would be useful to add to the ranking scheme in a future iteration? I think that goes to the question of the normativity of power involved, right? You try to do this, as you phrased just now, in a rather agnostic way. But um, what about the threat levels that different cyber powers would then uh, pose? So, if I may, let me take the answer in a slightly different direction, because this goes to the heart of perhaps one of the other questions. Why is this useful? We think that that, eight, that, that framework of eight objectives helps states understand threats and opportunities in each sphere. So if you broaden cyber power to, to beyond just security, which, which is clearly a very important element of it, but if you uh, widen it to uncover these other sort of traditional areas of, of government objectives, you might be able to spot what you can do with your cyber capability or potential in those fields, as well as perhaps uh, perceive threats and challenges to your objectives in those fears from other players. So, um, I if you take the framework and you build your national situation into it and you assess um, a given country's objectives against that, you, sh you, you might be able to find these threats and opportunities in a way that if you just focus on offensive, defensive, cybersecurity, you might miss out on. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that's, that's kind of what, what the heart of the question was. But and do you have anything to add to that? No, I, I, I mean, it's, um, yeah, it goes down of the, to the conceptualization of power itself, I think, and to this idea that it's a, a dual instrument. So whatever, you know, it, it poses a, uh, a threat and it's also a vulnerability at a certain point. So, so we have measures kind of along this line for all of our eight objectives and, uh, and of oh, seven objectives, sorry, uh, and uh, it's just important to, to, we have also delivered a very kind of, um, I mean, a detailed analysis and also like the background of the work we have done. So you really can dig into the indicators also we have used and that might kind of help to identify a specific threat, for instance, uh, if you're interested in that. And the data is also openly available, by the way. So just, but the, the, the concept of power itself is kind of, has this element in it. So I think, um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, 
one other question for you guys and then we move on to uh, to the next uh, panelists. Um, so one of the um, uh, people in the audience, uh, 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 a gentleman or a lady with the last name Samvel asked the question, um, North Korea is, uh, is nowhere in the graphs. Why is that? Um, can you explain? Yeah, yes. that's a very good point. <laughs> and it's not go. in the, it's not for this iteration uh, and it's not for, uh, for reason linked to the fact that uh, we we use uh, only um, publicly available data and <laughs> this is difficult to, to get. So that's like the short answer. Then the longer version of it would be that we are working on that. So we have on the intent part some elements we, we were able, and also on the capability part we we're able to gather some of the indicators. And for this, uh, and we will definitely want to include that in the next next iteration and we will kind of try to uh, work with specific experts uh, in the field uh, for to, to kind of find find proxies or, or kind of be able, but it will be like a special case and, can, and we cannot like apply the very same methodology. So that's why for this uh, iteration we decided to to leave it out. And what about um, Estonia? It's actually quite uh, low uh, in the rankings. So that really surprised me. Uh, I would have imagined it would have been a bit higher up. Can you say a little bit more on why Estonia is it doesn't is not in the top ten? Let's put it that way. So, I, I would say in our ranking there are a number of controversies. Um, I'd also add Israel as to one that people have questioned why it's lower down on the ranking. Um, one of the reasons is because we took a wider definition of cyber power than perhaps traditional uh, offensive defensive sort of. NATO sort of focus, sorry, uh, in terms of Estonia being a very important centre for NATO. And in that definition, it scored worse than some other nations that have perhaps taken a more comprehensive view of cyber power across all the eight objectives. So Netherlands was, a, for example, a surprise country for some, uh, for some, like, why was that scored so highly? Well, that was in part linked to the fact that it has quite a coherent cyber strategy. Um, we had a long discussion about India, and I completely agree with what a lot of the presenters said about India, that very diverse, different groups across lots of different organizations, no central coherence. Um, sorry, that's that, that's a different point, but but sort of, um, so um, Estonia didn't quite have that wider view of fiber power that perhaps some of the other nations did. Very clear, thank you. Okay, let's uh, move to you, uh, Eugene. Uh, there's a couple of questions for you as well. The first is from uh, Dennis Spoders. Um, so what are some of the main cybersecurity worries uh, in the Asian region? And uh, how do these relate to the 2015 GTE norms? Are there specific concerns that ASEAN would uh, like to see addressed in uh, GTE and uh, the open-ended working group? Uh, okay. Uh... So maybe I'll I'll take the the next question as well. Like, do I have any insights on how internal negotiations um, uh, to establishing official positions on the UNGG or NOEWG? Uh, answer is no. I don't have any insights uh, <laughs> apart from official uh, positions uh, published in the media. So I know when you know. Um, so. Great question, uh, Dennis. Um, so, in part, the main cybersecurity worries in the region is basically the cyber maturity in the region and the, dis the capacity disparity among ASEAN member states. Um, ASEAN member states have very different um, levels of cyber maturity. This, uh, if we use the Bell for Power Index, you know, since they're on the call with me, I might as well use use the uh, model, uh, the cyber, capable, cyber Capability Index uh, in its CPI notes that Singapore, Malaysia score, Singapore and Malaysia score highly on various objectives such as defense, intelligence and norms. But um, this is far from the regional picture. According to the 2017 SB, uh, which is the Australian Strategic Policy Institute's Cyber Maturity Report, Asia Pacific region has so far escaped a major state led cyber incident more because of the peaceful macro uh, environment than because of strong defenses and resiliency. So, at an individual level, more than 55% of people in the Asia Pacific region are still not connected to the internet. Um, while this represents a 
massive growth opportunity, it also points towards large scale early use of vulnerability as this population comes online. Um, the SP report also notes that some states in ASEAN region lack the capacity to make policies and to protect their critical infrastructure. Um, so that's why in my remarks, I put out there that cyber capacity, um, the cyber capacity building measures are important to understand how ASEAN has moved um, with their program and how it has moved to advance cyber norms because capacity building um, is important for states to have the capability and the um, knowledge uh, required to discuss all these uh, norms and um, uh, provide meaningful dialogue at the UN and other fora. Um, this in turn leads to uh, confidence building measures uh, in the region because the trust among uh, stakeholders in ASEAN is low. Within ASEAN, the lack of capacity uh, will hamper confidence and improving the capacity may improve the confidence that states have with one another um, and cooperate uh, for the common good. Um, outside ASEAN, there are states who have not been helpful with confidence building measures, uh, which makes intra-regional uh, cooperation a bit tougher. Um, so um, as for, so I'll leave that comment there. Uh, specific, um, so the third part of it is specific. Um, uh, where is that question? Uh, so specific, uh, uh, requests at the OEWG and the UNGGE. I think ASEAN just wants a rules-based international order uh, and it's just willing to be guided by an international rules-based international order. Yeah. Okay, uh, then there's a question to you, uh, Eugene, uh, again by Mr. Arvis uh, Samfell. Um, you made a distinction between ASEAN and ARF. To what extent does the latter influence the former? And the question is asked because uh, the speaker says ARF seems more an arena for great power politics and influence, influencing, especially in cyber. Yeah, uh, so another great question uh, to unpack what uh, ASEAN actually does. ASEAN typically works towards an open and inclusive uh, multilateralism, and hence they have actually many forums for dialogue. Uh, ARF is just one of them. You have ASEM, which is uh, the ASEAN Europe uh, meeting. Uh, uh, you have um, dialogues with the Middle East. Uh, you have ASEAN plus three, plus five. Many, many forums. ARF is not just the only one. Uh, ASEAN, uh, as for great power uh, compet uh, competition, ASEAN works on a posture known as ASEAN centrality where it acts on the basis of being the least objectionable actor. While I agree there's some level influencing by great powers, but because of ASEAN centrality, ASEAN adapts the initiatives to create an acceptable format for all uh, who participate in the forum. So that's my answer to that. OK, great. Um, then I think we should move to Kartik and Arin Rajit. Um, first question for you is uh, by Fabio Cristiano. Uh, to what extent are bilateral partnerships on cybersecurity and capacity building, such as the one with Israel, reflected in India's position on cyber norms? That's a that, that's a great uh, great question. Thank you. So I think to answer that, uh, can I just split it up into two separate questions? So one is, does that impact India's? I mean, again, cyber power or cyber security uh, posturing? Does it Im impact India's implementation of cyber norms? Yes. But the extent to which anything, including a bilateral agreement, actually translates into the extent and manner in which India negotiates is 
I think we have to do the empirics, but largely a product of the three factors that uh, Karthik uh, has found in historical regimes and the three factors that we apply. So even if you look at uh, bilateral uh, arrangements, whether it's with Israel or there's one with France, one with Australia, they are very either very, very high level at the normative level, so they don't really uh, articulate a clear position on the cyber norms debate. It's at best very vague, something like saying international law applies or there's nothing on cyber norms. It's more operationalization, funding, capacity building. So yes, is capacity building intrinsic to India's cyber posture? Yes, but that need not translate into uh, how and whether India negotiates or not. So just to uh, reiterate what the three factors are on whether they will impact on how India negotiates and through that hopefully I can also quickly uh, respond to two other excellent questions. So one is strategic interest and on this I'd like to refer to Max Meek's question on Pakistan and why Pakistan wasn't or isn't as significant a factor as China. So in the paper we do actually refer to a number of uh, tit for tat exchanges and disinformation operations that have been happening between uh, state linked actors and advanced persistent threats in India and Pakistan. But the question that we have to ask is whether India negotiating in a certain manner at the first committee or at the third committee enables India to leverage uh, their security position against against Pakistan. Whereas with China, possibly there is a, a, a clear uh, interest in terms of India actually say banning Chinese apps and referring to certain norms of responsible behavior, which they seem to argue that China does not comply with. With Pakistan, there is rarely been any ideological exchange on cyberspace at the normative level. It's largely just a string of uh, disinformation campaigns and, and tit for tat uh, cyber attacks. The second is institutions and uh, again uh, Roxana made a very valid point about institutional conflict and that's something we've referred to a fair bit where there are a number, there's an alphabet soup of domestic government organizations dealing with cyberspace, but they haven't really come together yet to articulate a coherent position. And the, the final question of course is on uh, the extent to which domestic uh, uh, actors, both civil society and industry are impacting that position. So whenever we look at whether a factor will impact India's negotiating position or not, that's a question that we think can be answered to this framework, but that's slightly different from uh, whether it will impact India's cyber power or uh, cyber posture as, uh, as a whole. And those are, I think, two separate questions. So uh, yeah, thank you. OK, very nice. Um... One more for you from Dennis Budus. Um, what do you think the opportunities are for an Indian role as a balancing power or third way in cyberspace between the US and China? Are there possibilities for cooperation with the EU in that role? Karthik, do you want to do you want to take yeah. that? Yeah, no, um, I think uh, I think as much as recent tensions have revealed a ostensible, ostensible binary choice uh, in terms of internet governance between the United States and China, I think this dichotomy is not reflected in Indian discussions on how to govern the internet. I think beyond states, there's a growing realization in New, in New Delhi that private actors really matter to um, global cyber governance, um, perhaps as much if not more uh, than states themselves. And I think if you look at the fault lines uh, are, incre are increasingly being drawn um, by states who back big, large technology firms, either in the US or China, that prefer certain global rules um, which make their life easier across markets, right? And I think for India, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a potential and a desire to place development and development discourses at the heart of most global cyber discussions. Um, and this could be in response to the fact that other countries, other major markets and jurisdictions um, are actually looking at using, uh, using trade agreements, using other kinds of global governance arrangements to make uh, life easier for their own firms abroad. Right, and so how can how can how can how can developing countries um, capably try to uh, combat this this uh, this development, if you if you, I mean, if you can call it that? And I think that that focus on development, 
that focus on placing um, the interests of developing countries uh, within global cyber discussions uh, is something that I think India is well suited to play in right now in the international order. Just if, if I can add, if I can add something quickly on the EU part of the question, just this is not directly connected with cyber norms, but there is a relevance. So uh, we've heard the term technological sovereignty or data sovereignty, which is different from the term information sovereignty, which is used in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Russian and Chinese documents. And both India and EU have actually constantly referred to this in policy instruments, largely policy instruments in, from the Indian side on the geoeconomic sphere, which as I mentioned, they've actually, we've actually been much more clear on. But the fact is that there seems to be an, an intent to enforce sovereignty against non-state actors, as Kartik was mentioning, in a manner that benefits uh, individual citizens, or at least that's what the policy documents seem to seem to suggest. And the European data strategy that was the draft of which was published in March, and if you look at the Indian non-personal data committee's report, both of them seem to refer to this overarching idea of data sovereignty. And there is a, a huge politics behind the use of the phrase data sovereignty in India. But what I can say is that it is definitely closer to Europe than it is with uh, the Chinese and Russian version of information sovereignty. I think that's something worth noting, even though it's not directly connected to the cyber norms or norms for responsible state behavior debate. It is connected to India's positioning on digital governance and, and cyberspace. And I think in that regard, India and EU have a fair bit in common. Uh, uh, I mean, another one which India hasn't opposed, but I hope we can oppose soon is uh, the EU uh, is take the EU line on extraterritorial surveillance. Like, for example, uh, the, the at least the judiciary uh, through Shem too has opposed extraterritorial surveillance by by the US and, and India hasn't really taken a stance on that yet, although that was uh, uh, mentioned as one of the factors for data localization. So definite convergence is there yet, but nothing nothing concrete for the reasons we, we mentioned. OK, great, thank you. The one final question uh, for you two, um, to what extent can we think of uh, the ambiguous position of India as a result of limited or miscoordination between various governmental bodies at the national level? Well, do you want to go first? Um, no, no, I think I already I've already uh, said that uh, it, it, it could be, but it's possibly changing. So Karthik, maybe you can add to it. Look, I, I think I think I think a fair amount of strategic, of strategic ambiguity also helps, right? Um, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm certain that a lot of these institutions domestically don't always speak to each other. They may not always be on the same page. Uh, there's policy incoherence in many areas. Um, but also at the same time, I think, uh, let's not forget that being ambiguous uh, at the global level on various issues uh, does help at some point, and at least until a point where you can understand what the interests of some of the other major powers are, uh, which way they are aligning, and how they are going to negotiate these very difficult issues uh, that are that are fundamentally strategic in their own minds as well. Um, so, strategic amb amb ambiguity is not. Um, can be an asset at times, um, whether that can be chalked on, chalked up to um, a lack of coordination between um, institutions internally or not. Um, I think occasionally that does help. Yeah. yeah, it's a very fair point. OK, a couple of questions for Taylor. Uh, on balance, has the increasing use of social media, sorry, this is uh, Alexi Drew asking a question from King's College. Uh, on balance, has the increasing use of social media as a means of communicating with publics in times of crisis been beneficial or not? Whose responsibility should it be to police or secure against imposter content? What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> Um, yeah, so really interesting question, and I'm sure Alexi has plenty of views uh, herself. Um, my you know, I think it really depends on the um, the type of disaster. Um, so, you know, if you're talking about an earthquake um, where you need quick responses and you need sort of um, often the warning is uh, is very 
um, it needs to be disseminated quite quickly. Um, that's somewhere where I think um, social media can actually uh, play a valuable role um, versus sort of a longer term, slower, slowly building um, disaster like um, a hurricane. You might actually want more official communication that involves um, steps that you can take to prepare. Um, so, you know, I, I think that in emergency uh, management communication, there's lots of different ideas about basically how long you have when issuing a warning. And so I think those timelines um, play a role in thinking about whether or not social media is appropriate uh, versus sort of uh, other platforms. Um, I think this really ties into sort of who's in charge of uh, helping to uh, sort of remove or, or at least moderate against imposter content. Uh, and I think part of this, um, you know, I, I think you need a lot of more platform moderation uh, in all of these spheres, but particularly when you're talking about um, quickly disseminating information in the event of a hur of a of an earthquake or something that that you need more fast moving uh, crisis management. Uh, so there's been lots of examples. I know there was an earthquake in California several years ago where there um, ended up being a number of fake hashtags that. Um, uh, that proliferated and then um, I think the uh, content platforms had to figure out a way basically to remove that content um, and actually use, uh, have the Twitter platform be disseminating helpful and useful information. Okay, as almost an automatic follow-up on that, uh, Stefan Susanto uh, asks, do you have any ideas on how to tackle the problem of disinformation campaigns against emergence, uh, emergency systems offensively, rather than going the resilience route on, uh, on the defensive end? And the second question he asks is to what degree are the campaigns that we've witnessed so far against emergency systems purely opportunistic, uh, rather than leveraged in a tactical way to achieve a discernible strategic outcome? Mm. Um. Yeah, so I mean, I think most of the solution sets that uh, are really being pushed have to do with resilience and education as well. Um, you know, I, I don't, I think other than um, really trying to defend emergency communication um, procedures, uh, I'm not sure um, how much, I, I'm not aware of a really good offensive uh, technique for trying to combat this. Um, but I do think that's really interesting. Can you repeat the second question? I apologize. I just deleted it, I'm afraid. There's a long list of questions in my screen, so I <laughs> chucked it oh, out after okay. I read it. Sorry. <laughs> it's the end of the day, guys. I'm getting tired here. <laughs> Do we still have the question somewhere? Um, no. Frantically searching for it now. No. I don't think we do. Apologies, I really, really managed to delete it completely. <laughs> Sorry, we'll just pretend that my lost. answer was was perfect and brilliant. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, I have a question of my own, uh, uh, actually, Taylor. You, uh, I read the paper that you sent in, and there was this big um, section on um, perfidy theory, and this mm. this. Um, uh, idea that under a, a, a traditional just war theory, uh, some acts are considered perfidious and some are not. And you made the comparison or you applied the rules of uh, labeling things as a perfidious act to uh, to this type of uh, imposter content. Can you can you say a little bit about that to this audience? Because I thought it was a fascinating point, actually. Yeah, absolutely. I had a, a very large graphic sort of trying to understand different theoretical frameworks for interpreting um, imposter content and for uh, uh, in the uh, aims of, of being a 10 minute presentation, I ended up sort of bearing that slide. Um, but I, I, you know, that sort of understanding, um, I'm really fascinated by perfidy and thinking about perfidy um, sort of bad faith deception as a way of thinking about um, how to moderate between acceptable cyber attacks and, and sort of cyber disinformation campaigns um, that use deception in, the, in an appropriate way, um, which is so often, again, predicated and, and sort of a, a foundation of this uh, field versus sort of wh where are the lines that we draw and then think about disinformation or an attack as actually um, operating off of bad faith and, and something that we want to avoid or perhaps even create a norm or, or a law against. Um, and so for, you know, uh, my previous work looked at cyber attacks, nonviolent, um, nonviolent cyber attacks and, and kinetic attacks and tried to understand essentially 
um, looking at survey experiments and interviews, how people interpreted the use of perfidy. Is that something that people are paying attention of, uh, of paying attention and, and really uh, reacting to, or is it sort of par for the course and, and they're mostly focused on outcomes as opposed to the methods? Um, and I've been really trying to think about how to apply that framework into disinformation. I think it's, um, I think it's, it's tricky, but it, it's interesting because again, so much of the focus on norm development in this space tends to be about outcomes. So, you know, most, much of the concern ends up being, you know, did uh, imposter content actually result in physical harms? Um, you know, and and it, it's pretty hard in disinformation in general to figure out a way to actually qu uh, quantify um, and, and understand uh, the impact. Um, but I do think that there is an institutional angle to this, which I highlighted in, in thinking about emergency management and response systems, uh, that these are eroding um, those public trust mechanisms in a way that that the actual, the method rather than just the outcome of a, of a disinformation campaign is actually important and something that we should be considering um, when trying to, again, um, create more robust, resilient um, systems against it. Okay, so you you focus on uh, on on on, or you, you emphasize means rather than only focusing on the ends. Would it also be helpful to expand our notion of harms and include not just physical harms but also informational harms? Uh, because then the whole disinformation debate fits right in there anyway, right? If we say it, it leads to societal harm because it undermines, I don't know, our trust in government and so on and so forth, that may not be easy to quantify. Uh, but it's definitely something that people are concerned over. So would you think that would be an avenue to uh, to think about this further as well or or no? Yes, yes, absolutely. And so in my framework, I have, um, you know, two different sort of outcomes based uh, interpretations. And one of those is very much on material outcomes. And then the other one um, includes these institutional uh, outcomes. So thinking about cooperative institutions being eroded as, um, while not physical, certainly an important um, outcome that you can point to. Um, and in my previous work on attacks, um, I found that actually uh, people were most worried about um, institutional sort of degradation, um, which uh, was was surprising in that um, it often uh, was more important than physical harms um, in a lot of these cases. Um, so I'd really, I'm, I'm hoping to um, apply this uh, survey experiment model to look at this in the case of disinformation campaigns. Um, but I do think that there is a way that this fits into, again, an outcomes-based framework. My other two theoretical frameworks were very much on means-based specifically. Um, and I found that at least in the case of uh, cyber attacks, they had a lot less saliency with your general public. Um, but but I think there there is sort of, sort of a, uh, an interesting way to look at you know do methods matter here or or is it just sort of um, a, a larger view of harms and outcomes? Very cool. All right. Well, I'm going to uh, wrap this up because we're almost at the end of uh, our time slot. I want to uh, first of all uh, thank all of our speakers for presenting today, also for sending in a wonderful. Uh, articles. I, uh, I read all of them with uh, with much pleasure. It was uh, an absolute joy to be reading your work. Um, I thank you all for the time you have uh, invested in preparing for your presentation and also uh, in answering uh, all these questions so diligently. Um, sorry for all the people who have asked questions whose turn has not been uh, around. Uh, I, I see that some of the uh, presenters have also answered uh, some questions uh, in the chat. So um, hopefully uh, everybody still feels happy and content after this first day of the conference. We are very happy that you joined us today. Thank you for your attention. We will uh, uh, hopefully see you again tomorrow morning. Um, the first session is at 10.30. Uh, and it's about information war warfare, emerging technologies and military strategies. Uh, and uh, I will be there most certainly, and I hope uh, you will join us uh, for the, the next up upcoming two days as well. All right, thank you for your attention and um, hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Bye bye. <laughs>